Hello everyone and welcome back to this Tech Time. In today's video, this is video for my Proxmox series. And today we're going to go through the step-by-step -step process of creating a virtual machine in Proxmox. So if you've been following along with me so far, your virtual machine should look similar to this one right here, where you don't have anything on your virtual machine whatsoever so far, unless you have been working ahead, that is. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna go to your node and you're gonna wanna go to summary and see how much resources your server has. In my situation, I have 14 gigabytes of RAM, which is more than enough for a virtual machine. So unless you have a server that has very few resources, you should have no problem creating a virtual machine. Now I know some people watching this may be running Proxmox on a virtual Pi or some other kind of single board computer. In those situations, you may want to be running a container, but in my situation, I'm fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this button that says create VM right here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select a node. It's going to automatically select PVE node 3 for me because that's the only node I have available here. If you're in a situation where you have more than one node, all you have to you just click this drop down arrow and then you can select the node you want to create it on and below that you have a field for vm id so each resource in proxmos will have its own id number now by default proxmos is going to go up to the next available id number that's not being used starting from 100 as you can see in this situation, since it's the very first virtual resource that I've created, it's going to default to 100. And each ID will be unique. So if I go ahead and use virtual machine ID 100 in this situation, I can't use ID number 100 again in the future. Now, it's up to you what to do in this situation. You may want to come up with a numbering scheme where certain devices fall under one category of numbers and other devices fall under another. In my opinion, that's not worth the trouble. So for me, what I do is I just go by whatever default number Proxmox gives. It. If you decide you do want to change yours, you just simply click on this box and then type in whatever your number you want to do. But for me, I'm going to keep it simple and leave it at the default 100, but it's completely up to you what to do. Now, I recommend you give it a name. You may already have a host name in mind for whatever you're planning on doing. Now, I'm going to name this one Web Server because later on, I'm going to actually put Apache on this virtual machine to show you that you can access it through a web interface if you need to. But I highly suggest you give it a name that signifies its purpose. So if you have a particular app that's going to be running on this virtual resource, you may want to name it after that. If you have a domain name that you want to tie it to, you add that in there. Whatever works for you in your environment. And over here you have a section for resource pool. Now right now we don't have a resource pool set up, but if you did have one set up, uh, such as network attached storage or other clustered machines together on this virtual machine, you can select what resources to add to this virtual instance. And this is all something we're going to cover later. So next we're going to come over here and we're going to click on OS. You could have also clicked next or back down here as well if you wanted to. And here's where it's going to look for an ISO image to load onto the virtual machine. And right now we have not added anything into it yet. So we need to do that step first before we can actually create a virtual resource. So to add an ISO image, we're going to exit out right here and then come over to our menu on the left. And if you don't already have this open, you would drop it down and you're going to click on the local storage. And then you'll see an option for ISO images. You would click on there and that would list any ISO images you have available if you've already downloaded one. In our situation, we haven't downloaded one yet, so there's nothing there. And what's cool here is that you can click this button to download an ISO image from a URL or if your computer that you're accessing your Proxmox from, you have ISO images already available, you can upload it from here. So what I'm going to do first is download Ubuntu 24 server. So I'm going to put in Ubuntu 24 server. Then I'm going to go to the official Ubuntu repository and we'll click download 2404. And what we're going to do is we're going to right click this download now and we're going to copy link address and then we'll go back over to our Proxmox node and we'll click download from URL and we will paste that URL we copied and then click query URL and then automatically determine the file name you're downloading and the type of image it is as well as the size. And now I'll click download and this will probably take a minute so I'm going to pause the video. And as you can see the task is finished. It says task OK. So we'll close this and then we'll go back and click create VM. And again if you want to do a host name we're going to do whatever host name you wanted to do and whatever ID number you wanted to do and then whatever node you wanted to put it on and click next to go to OS system. And this time under ISO image you can click the drop down button and you'll see Ubuntu 24 server. We're going to select that. And then here you're going to select the type of OS you're using. Now, if you're using a Linux image, it should default to Linux, but you want to always make sure that it goes to the right system for you because if there's a discrepancy between the two, it will cause the virtual machine to have issues being created. 
and then under version you can select the version but again with linux isos it tends to default to the correct options and we'll click next and then here you have some system settings you can set uh, for example you have the scuzzy controller that you can change from the default but for right now i'm going to leave everything at the default and you can also change the graphics card right here if you need to and even the bios if you needed to but you typically don't need to touch anything on here typically the defaults are what you're going to need and that's how i'm going to leave them in this video as well so just keep in mind you can change it here if you do find yourself in a situation where you need it so we'll click next and here you have some options that are specific to the virtual hard disk itself and the first thing I want to point out is that Proxmox does have a service for disk card, which if you're using an SSD, this is going to come in handy to help you save space and prolong the lifespan of your SSD. So I'm going to click that because this machine is using SSDs. But if you're using a spinning disk card drive, there's really no point in checking that box. If you needed to change the order of hard drives on the bus, you could do that here, but we're going to leave that alone. And here's where you can change the storage. It's going to default to the local LVM, which is correct in this situation because we don't have any other storage. So again, we're going to leave it alone. Now, Proxmox defaults to a disk size of 32 gigabytes, which is a little overkill for our situation. So I'm going to change that to just 16 for now. Basically, you would set this to how much gigabytes of storage you believe you're going to be using on this virtual machine. If you think you're going to be using a lot of storage on the virtual machine yourself, you might up that number. In my situation, I'm not going to be using a whole lot of storage on this virtual machine. So I I downgraded the number to just 16 but that's completely up to you and your use case so we'll click next and now we're at CPU options. Now, depending on how many cores your physical device has will determine your options here. The more cores you have, the better. But the way I look at it, if you're not really going to be doing a whole lot on this virtual machine, if it's not really going to be under a heavy load on a regular basis, there's no reason to give it that many cores. But now if you're using something like Nextcloud or OwnCloud, something that's going to be used really heavy, you may want to crank that up. And you can do that simply by hitting the up arrow or the down arrow. But for right now and for this video, I'm going to leave it at the default of one because that is more than enough to launch an Ubuntu server. My general rule of thumb is to leave it at one and only crank it up if you see that your resources are being starved for CPU as it's running. So if you find that your virtual machine is running at 100% CPU all the time, you may want to go into the settings and increase the amount of cores it has access to. But again, that's up to you and your use case. When it comes to memory for this video, I'm going to leave it at 2048 or 2 gigabytes. But that all depends on how much memory you have available on the server itself. So if you're lacking in memory, you, you may want to knock it down to just 1 gigabyte. But as you saw previously, I have plenty of memory on the server, so I'm going to leave it at 2 gigabytes. If you do set this to a low number and you find that the operating system crashes on a fairly regular basis, then you've probably set this too low and you need to go into settings and increase the amount of memory it has. But for now, I'm going to leave it at the default and I'm going to go on to network. Now, in an enterprise environment, it's a good idea to separate the management interfaces from the VM network, but I can't do that because I only have the one interface on this server. And this is VM BR0 or VM Bridge 0, which is okay for now. But in an enterprise situation, your server will more than likely have more than one interface and you would want to separate the management interfaces from the VMs. So even though we're not going to do that in this video, that's something to keep in mind for if you ever find yourself in an enterprise environment. So we'll click next. And then it's going to give you a summary of all the settings you made. And you could click start after created if you wanted to, which means that the VM will automatically start as soon as it finishes being created. But we're not going to do that right now. We're just going to click finish. And you can see 100 right there, which is the VM we just created. And so it is created, but it's not running though. But before I start it, let's take a look at the options for this VM. We'll click on options. And I'm not going to go through all of them right now, but you want to keep in mind start at boot. So if you don't have this set in your virtual machine and then the server was supposed to go through a power cycle, this VM would not automatically start itself. So if you wanted to edit this, you would just click on start on boot, click on edit, and then select this box to start on boot and click OK. You also have a start and shut down order, which if you had different VMs that one needed to be restarted before the other, which is going to be really helpful if you had multiple VMs that needed to be started in a particular order, you can come over here and edit this and select in which order they needed to be started up and set a delay for it. But we don't have that right now, so we'll just close this out. But keep in mind that you can change that in the options for the VM. Now the guest agent right now is disabled, which is okay, and we may turn that on later. But for now, let's go and start our server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the console access. And then I'm going to click start now. And this is our Ubuntu 20 server starting up. And if you notice now that it's all started, you have a green arrow up here indicating that it's running. And what you see right here is the VM is actually starting up. 
It's the exact same thing you would see if you were starting a physical Ubuntu server. And I'll give this a little while to start up and pause the video. And here we are at the installation process for Ubuntu server. Now Ubuntu server's installation process is pretty straightforward. First you're going to select your language, which for me is English, and I'm going to click enter. And I'm doing all this from the keyboard, and it will give you an option to update the installer if there's a new update for it. I'm going to continue without starting, so I'm going to click enter. And I can tell what's currently selected by the green highlight down here at the bottom. And so now it's going to ask you for a keyboard layout. Mine's going to default to English, which is fine for me. If yours was different, you would take the arrow key on your keyboard and go up to the different sections and then you can select them and change them but i'm going to go to done and hit enter and then it's going to ask you if you want to do the ubuntu server standard or the ubuntu server minimized the default is just to select ubuntu server which is what i'm going to leave it at but you could also select search for third-party drivers if you wanted to so i'm going to go on down to done and click enter it's going to want you to configure at least one interface and you should see it default to your interface on the virtual machine itself and so again in most situations the default is going to be what you're going to need so we're going to select done and hit enter it's going to ask for a proxy address if you're proxying to the internet we're not doing that in this situation so we'll select done and then you'll see the mirror address for the Bluetooth database that it's going to be pulling updates from which in this case should be fine so we're going to click done and it says it's still checking for the mirror but we're going to just click continue since this is a vm and i'm pretty sure it's going to do fine since we got this far i'm going to click continue and then it's going to start installing the system and it's going to default to using the whole disk which on this machine is on this virtual machine itself is fine if you had something different you wanted to do you can do that here by just selecting it with the keyboard hitting the space bar and enter and moving down but i'm going to leave it at lvms and click done for the whole disk and this is going to confirm the file system with you and again the default in most situations is going to be fine so we're going to click done again it's going to ask you to confirm and it's going to highlight continue in red because that's going to actually erase this virtual machine disk now this is the disk on the virtual machine itself this is not the disk on the server so we're going to click enter and continue and it's going to want a username it's tech time it's going to want a server name and i'm just going to be simple and call it web server i always use the same username as my name which is it's tech time and then a super secret simple password and then keep going down to done and if you want to enable ubuntu pro you can do that here i'm going to skip that and hit enter i'm going to go ahead and select install open ssh server but i'm not going to import keys so i'm going to go on down to done and click enter and that's all that i'm going to install during the setup process so i'm going to scroll on down to done hit enter and now it's going to start installing the system so i'm going to pause the video again because this will probably take a while and here we are finished so you should be able to hit the arrow key and go down to reboot now and click enter and this error message is just where it's trying to unmount a cd-rom drive that doesn't exist so we'll just click enter to move past it and it will reboot the virtual machine and now our server is finally booting up and the very first boot of a new ubuntu server will take longer than other reboots of the server so we're just going to sit here and wait for it for a minute and the last thing it does is the ssh fingerprint so you should be able to press enter and see a login prompt and you're going to type in the username type in your password as you can see it's successfully logged in now and so now we have a web server instance and i prefer working from the terminal so i'm going to switch over to that now but first i'm going to run ipa and pull my ip address and now i'm successfully ssh into my web server instance using the ip address for it and it is running in proxmox and you should be able to tell that because we have a virtual CPU mentioned when you bring up the CPU info file. So this is definitely running inside of a Proxmox server. And the next thing you should always do with a fresh install of Ubuntu server is update it. So I'm going to run sudo apt update to update our repository list and put in my sudo password. And as you can see, even though I just downloaded this installer, there's already 54 packages to update. And sudo apt upgrade minus y. And that may take a while, so I'm going to pause the video. So now that's finished, I'm going to clear the screen. And the next thing I'm going to do, increase the font size a little bit so you can see. The next thing we're going to do is install the QEUM guest station for our distribution of Ubuntu. And I'll show you how to do it here for Ubuntu. The first thing we're going to do is run sudo apt install. And the package name is QEMU-guest-agent. And now I will press enter. And that should go by pretty quickly. And I'll put Y for yes to confirm. And so now that's done. So let's clear the screen. And now let's check the status of that particular service. And to do that, it's a system CTL status QEMU dash guest. And you can use tab to autocomplete and then press enter to see if it's running. 
and so it's not actually running which is a problem so we'll need to start it up and we can simply run the same command again and this time put start and you'll need to run it with sudo permissions so put sudo at the front of it so sudo systemctl start qemu guest services and press enter so as you can see it's taken a little while which is to be expected and that's because we have it disabled in proxmox so what we need to do is we need to go back to our proxmox web interface and then on our web server, we'll go to options, and then we'll go down here to QEMU guest agent. We'll select it, go to edit, and we're gonna select use QEMU guest agent. And then we'll just click okay. And anytime you see a setting in red on a VM, that means that that setting will not take effect until that virtual machine has been restarted, which is okay. So we'll go back to our terminal. And back at our terminal, we'll see that that failed, which is okay because we just now enabled it and we need to restart. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run sudo power off and that will actually shut down our virtual machine. So we'll go back to our Proxmox interface and we have a guest is not running message at the console. We'll go to options and see that this is still red, which is okay because our server is not on online right now, which again, we can tell by the faded out display image. So I'm gonna select the server, right click and go to start. And then instantly we see our red enabled has turned to just enabled. So we'll go to our console and we can see that our server is starting up. And then now our server is up and ready to go. So we'll go back to the console and we SSH back into the console. So we'll check the status again. And I just up arrowed back to the system CTL status command and hit enter and we see it's now running. If for some reason it wasn't running, you can go back up and change this to start or stop, whatever you needed to do. And don't forget to put sudo in front of that command. We don't need to do that because it's already running. So I'm going to hit control C to cancel out. And so now for the fun of it, I'm going to run sudo apt install apache2, hit enter, put in my password, hit enter to confirm. And now that that's done, clear the screen. And so now if we go to our IP address in a web browser, we will be met by the default Apache 2 Ubuntu page. So now we can tell not only is the VM working, but we're actually able to access an application that is running inside the virtual machine, which is pretty cool. And so now you have your own virtual machine, which is pretty cool. And you're probably excited to get started creating other virtual machines. But in the next video, I'll show you how to turn this virtual machine into a template so that it will save you some time when creating future virtual machines. So if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe down below and share it with somebody that may find it interesting. And be sure to leave any questions or comments down in the comment section down below. And I will see you in the next video.